I think the 1992 view is is optimistic, and I've taken the view that the result could definitely be worse than 1997. There, there are there are concrete political science reasons for believing that if you fought the you know the same election next time as you fought like then, it would be worse. Danny, is this 1992 or is it 1997? Yeah, I've seen that uh, that debate, and I think it leaves out of the equation the possibility it could be worse than 1997, uh, and. Uh, there are, there are reasons why you might think it'd be better, so you can uh, advance that. You can say that, um, that it doesn't feel like the way that it felt when there were crises literally in every news news cycle. I was working for the Conservative Party in that period, and the Conservative Party had been then in power for 18 years rather than 13 years. You can put all those points. But at the same time, in 1997, the economy was actually going quite well, uh, and it's the economy that drives elections. Uh, so there are uh, reasons why, you, why it could be worse than in 1997. I think a 1992 view, looked at myself, is a bit optimistic. For I can see why... You know, William Hague was arguing this morning that that's the mindset the Conservative Party's yeah. got to get into because if you, you know, what one of the things that happened in the run up to the ninety seven election is everybody thought they were the party strategist, so no one would stick to anything because everyone thought they knew better, and uh, maybe they even did um, because the strategy <laughs> certainly didn't work. Um, so the, the the biggest reason for thinking it's not like nineteen ninety seven is that is that Keir Starmer is not Tony Blair, um, but uh, the biggest thing for thinking it's worse than nineteen ninety seven is the economy. Um, I certainly think 1992 is optimistic um and i you know if you look at the big issues on which the conservative party could run a negative campaign mm. against labor as well alongside uh, you think well what's the positive yeah. side of that so in 1997 it was possible to run a campaign that britain's booming don't let labor blow it britain will not be booming um and even that booming bit didn't work um the Conservative Party will not be able to run a campaign, obviously, on the National Health Service, um, and I don't think I don't think even on the strikes. Um, so you're, you're left with thinking this rather sort of thin gruel of woke might work, um, and I, again, it, I don't think it will. So the only thing that the Conservative Party can rely on uh, is something that I think isn't that reliable, which is that Rishi Sunak's, uh, and you know with the public still making up his mind about him, that that falls the right way for the Conservative Party and people think, yeah. well, actually, you know, we could we could keep him. Uh, and I think that's possible. Again, I think it's optimistic given all the other things that are going against the Conservative Party. So this um, William Haig, uh, well, he was on Times Radio making this point, but he also made this point at the uh, the Checkers Away Day last week where he was also the after-dinner turn, David. And it, in fact, it does feel to me a bit like, you know, you have to say something... Uh, because you, you, you yeah. wouldn't be earning your money as an after dinner speaker if you turned up and said, "No, you are absolutely stuffed." So you need yeah. something. And 1992, when uh, John Major won an unexpected victory, uh, is something. But you know, we could be, I don't know, 1923 if we want to. You know, how far back do you need to go looking for uh, examples of um, uh, of people turning it around? And we haven't been in the situation, I don't think, of having had so many prime ministers and a big economic crisis. And the public services, you know, the, the, the things, you know, there's no reason that history does need to repeat itself. Not since the state bed was first used <laughs> has there been a situation like uh, like this. I mean, I, I felt very much the same as, as you did, Matt, which is it would have been incredibly impolite for uh, William Hague to go along to checkers and tell them that they were screwed. Um, and there's very much little actually that they can do, but he, but 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 his argument about how if we kind of just have the will to win, that will be part of that get us part of the way. It reminds me of when I was a a young liberal communist, and we used to go along to these rallies, um, and and by and large you used to go out canvassing for the communist party, and you get about you know one percent of the vote if that, but everything you still do it. Um, and, 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 and the party leaders would say, look, if we just put enough effort in, we just sell enough morning stars. So when I was a student, I used to sell the morning star on the steps of the student union. And the guy from the International Marxist Group, he was selling his paper. And the woman from the International Socialist, she was selling her paper. And in the end, we ended up all selling our papers to each other so that we could get off the steps of the student union and go and have <laughs> breakfast. Um, and, 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 and this and this core way of looking at it is known as voluntarism, which is if you just put enough effort in, you just will it enough, then in that case, people will see the light. No, the problem is people didn't want what we were selling and they don't want what the Conservative Party is selling. That much is so 
bl blindingly obvious, and they're not going to want it, I wouldn't have thought, in two years' time. I mean, uh, when we said, you know, Danny was saying um, uh, maybe there aren't quite such disastrous headlines, I think one should just look at the front page of today's paper. They're all disastrous. Every single headline. It's true. I, 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 I would yeah, only... So you've I... got pressure mounts on randomly rude and abrasive rob, parents in limbo over classroom walkouts... Uh, I mean, uh, no. roses are red, violets are blue. Valentine's bot is here for you. <laughs> Maybe they can take some it looks comfort some, from moon. There pig. are there are there are some aspects of it, as I said, that are worse than 1997 because though of those economic yeah. headlines. They're, they're having worked on the 1997 campaign. There's no doubt that there's a little bit more variety in the political coverage. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's the best that I can say. And I, I wasn't, put, you know, by any means putting an optimistic view of it. That's the best I can say. Um, so I, I, I think the 1992 view is is optimistic. And I've taken the view that the result could definitely be worse than 1997. There, there, are, there are concrete political science reasons for believing that if you fought, the, you know, the same election next time as you fought like then, it would be worse. And I, I think... You know, one one of the things that happened in the in a couple of years, which we haven't, you know, we are now only just reaching before the nineteen ninety seven election, was that a lot of political people worked out um, that Labour was going to win the general election, and you got a defection of all sorts of uh, opinion formers um, who were a lot who begun to align themselves with what they thought was going to happen because no one wants to be the idiot who ends <laughs> up saying you know things are all rosy with the Conservatives just before they get forty five yeah. seats. Well, so you, that, that then that then it accelerates it. So uh, I think that we we haven't had that yet, and that also could still come. So that could make the situation worse. Yeah. So I don't rule out uh, an election result worse than 1997. But, but, you know, but I would say that it's not as locked in uh, as I felt it was in 1995. Um, that, you know, I would be astonished if the Conservative Party uh, got another majority. And if it doesn't get a majority, there will be a, turn, a change of government. It's not out of the question that Labour doesn't get a majority. That's the, that's the way I'd put it. And actually, I wonder whether, um, uh, David, the, the, the key question, then whether or not Labour gets a majority is more down to Labour. Uh, there's a, there's a, I thought it was a great line in uh, William Hague's piece. He said, Keir Thomas team are currently interesting because they are judged to be close to power rather than being close to power because they are judged to be interesting. And there's a big question about can Keir Starmer turn it up to 11 in the next 18 months, actually excite the public, reach into places where he's unlikely to, get a little bit of that Blair stardust, which ultimately will make the, probably the difference between being the biggest party and, being, uh, and having a majority. David? Yeah, I mean, uh, all this feels to me like trying desperately to find a way to keep the election, next election, uh, competitive. <laughs> I have to say, uh, but by, partially by kind of reworking history. I mean, it's worth re recalling that at the point when John Major was in the same period in his uh, leadership as Rishi Sunak, the Conservatives were either even uh, level pegging or were ahead in the polls. And right now they're double digit. In fact, they are up to 20 points uh, down in the polls. There just, there just simply doesn't seem to be a point of comparison. Um, and if you also look at the demographics of voting, I mean, if you just look at, uh, I'm not talking about young people, I'm talking about under 50s mm. here uh, uh, and the way in which they vote differentially from people over 65 and so on. It just looks catastrophic to me for for, for the yeah. conservatives. Yeah, and actually, we talked about that the other day that, that they've they've they people keep saying oh they've lost millennials they're down ten points but they're down twenty points with the over sixty. I don't disagree. Look, you know, you, yeah, yeah. this is the result of you know a, at least a year to eighteen months. You know, and people can argue then on the basis of politics whether it lasted longer than that of what. You know, any objective person has got to conclude was calamitous leadership. Yeah. You yeah. cannot do elect a you know get rid of one leader of the uh, um, a country because of the party scandal and various other scandals. Um, you know, and re and a repeated failure to tell the truth and replace them with another one that fell within forty four days and then expect the electorate to carry on trusting you. People vote conservative. I always believe that one of the reasons people vote Conservative is because they think the Conservative Party will produce quiet, uh, competent government. And if it fails to offer that, it doesn't offer much to people. And and um, I, I think it, you know, plainly did fail to offer that. And it's extremely difficult yeah. to pull that back. Yeah. I think it's the right... What he's doing broadly is the right strategy, but I don't, you know, but I think it's chances of working as small, yeah. yeah. Well, so let's turn our attention to, well, actually it's on front of most of the papers today, the Princess of Wales, 
has launched a campaign to highlight the importance of early childhood. And she's got various celebrities signed up the, um, and a video which is going to be shown in cinemas of a sort of claymation baby. And we're all supposed to be thinking about early early childhood. Um, Fern Cotton, I think, and uh, Professor Green. Who I don't need that to tell you who Professor Green is now. Um, uh, you actually don't. Oh, there we are. Very good. Right. Yeah, he's a character from Cluedo. Um, uh, <laughs> should... I mean, on the one hand, this is a nice thing. Who can possibly disagree with early years? But what happens if the next government says we're going to cut early years funding so we can cut taxes? Is she going to man the barricades? Should... I mean, I suppose the royals have got to do something. <laughs> but uh, is this what she should be doing? Discuss. I, I don't know. I'm just posing the question. Well, I don't know what exactly um, you know the constituent parts of her campaign is, but there's obviously a lot of um, a lot of work that people can do to educate children, which doesn't necessarily depend on the exact level of government spending. Yeah. So I suppose uh, there are things that she can do that aren't directly political, and she's picked something that I suppose isn't that contended at the at the moment. Um, it could slide into politics, and she'd have to be careful if it yeah. did, I guess. But I'm, I would suppose that's also true of their campaigns over mental health. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, my view of it is there are lots of things, um, you know, I, I wrote last week about loneliness, for yeah. example, um, and and human collection and relationships. There are lots of things that human beings can do uh, to improve their lives that are not dependent upon government spending, but people may not realise they should be doing them. And the royal family can... Can, can concentrate in those areas. So I don't suppose that just because you say something's a good thing, that necessarily means you're saying that the government needs to spend X or Y amount of money on it. Yeah. So you can avoid the, that. that. But I way. suppose if, if at the next election, one party, if Keir Starmer's whole election campaign is predicated on early years reforms, it does yeah. then start becoming more political, doesn't it? Well, it I, I answer know. that as I answer a lot of things, but is it? <laughs> to do that? I don't well, we think don't so. Know. So therefore, we it's not know. a. So, so therefore, it's not a problem. And yeah, when yeah. it becomes a problem, we'll yeah. come back on your show and talk Very about good. it. That'd be my approach. David, is it? A, is it a problem? No, <laughs> it's really not a problem. It's not a problem. I, I think I, it, this is what happens. I think when Matt Chorley gets a B in his body about something about a question and sort of think, oh, I'm going to tease away at this one. I mean, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, well, firstly, this is completely non-contentious. I mean, the overall kind of you know the idea that early years matter. I, mean, I, I suppose there might be somebody on well, the kind of right it, wing so, of, so it, of the reform in that case, party. What's that, the point? Is it just to give us something to do? Because that's the point. Because if it if it's not contentious, then there's no point in doing it, is there? Well, no, 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 no. Some things are worth doing even if they're not contentious. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think we're getting carried away by the nature of our jobs here a bit, uh, uh, Matt. Quite a lot of people do useful work in non-contentious areas. Um, it is pretty kind of pretty consensual. And the question about what to do about it and so on, kind of pushing for things to be done about it, that could conceivably be a bit more contentious, but not really. Uh, both parties or all parties would then say, well, the question is how you then go about something and at which uh, doing this in policy terms, at which point, of course, or somebody like Kate steps out of the discussion altogether because she won't take part in that bit of the discussion. So she will um, encourage those charities that are doing work in these areas, say warm words about the general proposition, etc., uh, and uh, and pretty much leave it at that. I would guess. Um, uh, but maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she will actually turn around before the next election and say, after looking at the main manifestos, I do think now that the SNP approach towards child <laughs> early childhood is probably the best one, and I only wish we had it across the whole of the united kingdom but i think that's not going to happen well i'm glad i'm glad that we've sorted that out i don't like i have a bee in my bonnet really <laughs> um do you are you both braggers that's that's my last apparently we need to cut our self-deprecation in half uh and brag like an american to get ahead at work <laughs> uh do you are you a bragger david um I'm not only I'm not a bragger, I don't think. I also hate them. I absolutely hate it. It's my mother's fault. She was deeply English. Um, and the first, almost the first phrase I can remember from what she said to me when I was little was, don't show off. Oh, Stop yeah. Stop showing off. Which, of course, children shouldn't really be told not to do. But anyway, I mean, what's the point of being a child and not being able to show off a bit? That's what she did. And that's infected my entire kind of approach. So I can't stand braggarts. I can't stand boasting. I won't do it myself. I probably actually don't believe this or not. I may be overstated in opinions, but I don't think I'm overstating in kind of pushing my own case and my own, uh, uh, and my own virtues. I really genuinely loathe it. So anybody bragging around me and boasting around me 
is likely to do themselves a disservice insofar as I have anything to do with their preferment. <laughs> They're going to have to hope that I don't. You're almost bragging about your lack of bragging. <laughs> it's a, what, what about you, Daddy? Well, you know, I, I, I definitely catch myself occasionally doing something which which is probably bragging or name dropping or um, sort of in a kind of passive aggressive way uh, saying something that um, isn't self-deprecating let's put it that way um, and I can't decide whether that means that I'm alert to my bragging or uh, whether I'm actually blithe to it I can't really decide <laughs> about that um, I, I I certainly sort of slightly bridled at the idea that people ought to do more bragging except for one piece of advice which I think data does suggest is correct and that is that that women probably don't um do things like asking for promotions or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, telling their boss about the things that they've done in order to get pay increases as much as men do so pro probably this advice is better for women who don't brag enough um and not to be encouraged for men who in my experience, do brag quite a lot, and I probably include myself um, in it as much as I, as much as my own um, uh, bragging will, will uh, embarrass me immediately after I've done it. It doesn't always <laughs> stop me before. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all, we're all slightly prone to that. Um, it's an interesting point though about um, women, David, and that's probably true in journalism and in politics. That there's uh, yeah, a certain I think... type of man prone to. To, to a certain type of not hugely talented man yeah. putting himself forward for all sorts of things in a way that women might not. There is a kind of shamelessness which some men can adopt, which is to force people to take them at their own recognizance. It's a kind of, uh, it's a form of narcissism. Um, it's, if I kind of say this thing about myself strongly enough, then you will kind of believe it must be true because I believe it so strongly. And it does attach itself much more to men. All I would say is that by and large, that's really damaging. And, and the idea that women should do it as well as men so that they can both be equally damaging in their, uh, <laughs> in their ridiculous self claims is, is slightly puzzling. Although I do, uh, slightly problematic. I do entirely take down his point that at certain points in careers, I have also seen women who are reluctant to um to speak up for themselves in a kind of particular way or at least to enter into the kind of com ideas competition with the with the kind of self-interested vigor that men quite often do it and so i can see the point he's making uh, just fine you want to talk about planes david I just wanted to mark this is the this is the last uh, week in which Boeing has produced a Boeing 747, the jumbo. And I just wanted to say, I remember long after they first came in, the first time I ever got on a jumbo jet, it was one of them and took off on a jumbo. It was one of the most re exciting moments of my entire life. The thing was so big, so crazy. Um, I will never forget it. And insofar as we're, I mean, obviously there are quite a few in the sky still, but there won't be any more produced. So I just wanted to kind of show are. a tear in my eye for the demise of the 747. <laughs> Danny, any, any views on the 747? No, I, I've, I didn't, I'm, I wouldn't even be quite sure which one was which. <laughs> um, and they always announce, <laughs> you know, objectively, it must obviously make a difference what kind of jet you're flying in. But I know as long as it goes to my destination, I never... But, uh, you know, but David's right to think these things are a complete miracle, particularly their size and the fact that they can fly. Yeah. If you start, thinking about, really if you start quite, thinking about too much, it's weird. That is really cool. That big metal thing. <laughs> and how did it, yeah. Quite extraordinary. Lovely stuff. Quite extraordinary, as you both are. I'll brag on your, your, on your behalf. Uh, Daniel Finkelstein and David Ivanovich, you can read the both of the Times this week. Just get yourself a subscription. Go to thetimes.co.uk. <laughs>